Hello and welcome back to the Impossible Farm. Last week you watched us set up a multi-purpose straw bale composting project which is doing fine. It has heated up just as expected. This week we're going to move over to another area of our property. We're going to be doing a whole makeover for an area that we call Arcadia, which begins with saying goodbye to some beloved friends. Ooh, I can't wait to see their first egg. In our first three years out here, uh, we lived in a yurt um, while we built our house. The house was built from um, trees right here on the property and we learned a lot about sawing uh, lumber. We learned a lot uh, about um, gardening and uh, mostly we uh, just got here and um, got to know our little piece of property. So now that we've been here a while, we want to grow food. Before we moved off grid to the woods, our gardening experience was in suburban lots or urban lots. A nice square or rectangular raised beds with um, an even amount of sunlight, nice and flat, irrigate from a hose coming from the side of the house. Those skills don't translate directly to three acres of extremely varied oh, terrain. You can move 10 nice feet here and you're in a different place as far as what the soil conditions are and how much sun there is. We're trying to learn to paint, be artists with light and um, water. And that's a, there's, it's totally magic. It's magic in a really intimidating way because we don't necessarily have our, our perceptions tuned to be able to see what's going on with light and water, but it's also magic in a really beautiful way because sometimes you get it to work and then you don't have a system that requires you to babysit it every single minute. You have a system that thrives just like nature thrives. That's what we're going for. That's our dream here. That's our impossible farm. We have spent the last month or so on our homestead making a plan for how to make the various pieces uh, and, and elements on our homestead fit together. And one element that really doesn't fit with anything else right now is our goats. When we were out here for just a couple of years, we thought we'd get goats because goats are cool. Goats do a lot of things. We had brush to clear. We are looking forward to milking goats. And um, we just didn't have a great way to manage them out in the thick forest that we have. Um, we didn't make it work. This sweet hazelnut has been good company, good adorable faces for a long time. Um, and we have bred Tulip. Tulip has been bred and we did milk her. Um, although we dried her off before we went on vacation this year. So we have experienced the ways in which goats can be helpful or productive, but we haven't had them integrated in any useful way with other things here on the homestead. We liked having goats, but the way that we use them and the way that we were really prepared to use them were really mostly as pets. Uh, they weren't a terribly productive animal for us, and that's our failing and not theirs. They're just goats. You held her on her on your lap when you were just a little baby, or when she was just a little baby. She wants to know if you have some food. I, I once did their chores and hay, and one time when I was going down the hill, Hazelnut like jumped, jumped, jumped on me, and and I grabbed her collar and we started racing down the hill. It was pretty fun. Once Tulip put a goat, she had two babies. Can you tell me what they were, what they were called? Odin and Tumble Babe. Oh, 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 oh. One would, couldn't walk so much that it tumbled down so much. So we named it Tumble Babe. Well, the other one was Odin because 
Yeah, Odin. I remember feeding them hay through the fence. No, that was straw. Mm -hmm. Straw. Out of the own. Out of our own. I'm feeding them hay. Out of our own grass at the big pond. You, you cut turn. some hay for them and gave it to them? Yeah, I didn't mm -hmm. cut it. I just scooped it off the ground, put it into a bundle. Before I ran away to the woods to live a quiet life, I used to be a theater director and playwright. And in that field, we had an expression called killing your darlings, which meant that if there's something wrong with your production, if there's something wrong with your play, probably the thing that you should look at is your favorite part. Very likely that part with the really snappy dialogue is actually a scene that's really not needed to move the play forward. Or that one bit that makes you just laugh and laugh and laugh isn't something that anybody gets but you. We're having that experience in a way with our beautiful goat barn and the goats themselves. They've been very special to me. We got goats and built that barn at a time when I didn't feel like homesteading was working for me. It's a symbol for me of staying put. It's the first time Nick ever used concrete in any form, a, a permanent thing, to set the piers for that little mini house, which was his practice for our house that we live in now. It's very special to me. That was your handprint. Do you remember? This one was Stella. This one was Nano. Then this one was mine. All of those are wonderful, true human things, but none of them are farming. So, these ladies are gonna go, and uh, we hope to um, add them back at some point. So now we, now we say goodbye. Goodbye, Tulip. Goodbye, Hazelnut. Let's give hugs. Thanks for being our goats. We sold them all to the same person. They're all in the same place. Um, so they're okay, the goats are okay, and we are mostly okay making uh, sometimes the harder choices in order to really make our homestead makeover the most effective that it can be and move forward into a really bright future for ourselves. Buying hay for animals that are in an enclosed uh, sacrifice area is an addictive input. It's not useless because they do transform it into manure, which we are then able to use to um, enhance the fertility of the property. But it isn't going to go away unless we can find a way to feed our animals off of the property. Huh. All right, say goodbye, girls. Bye. Bye. Hey, do love. I'm gonna miss them. You will. Let's go to Arcadia, Milo. Yum. Wait, let We're me see. We're gonna have omelets to match. Oh, can I see? Wow, Stacey. they see a nice nesting spot there. Oh, it's all, they're all the Americanas. Oh. One of the Americanas has been laying there. Huh. Don't break them, girls. That's why we, why we don't have very many eggs here, because one? one of them is hiding them here. That's a good egg laying spot. So, it's not a terrible day. Uh, my wife and kids, they lost some pets, but they were largely uh, just pets. They weren't doing the work that they're capable of. We treated them well, but uh, we were just feeding them uh, from the store and uh, they weren't living up to their full potential. So they're moving on to some place where they will be used and we are moving on to other plants. The best part about this is we got a little bit of money out of those goats and with that money we bought an electric fence. What does the electric fence do for us? It gives us options. Rather than 
having an established place with um, fencing that's hard to put up f just specifically for animals. We can now put animals kind of anywhere on our property and have them do the work that they're capable of doing. First thing we're doing is putting a bunch of chickens inside of electric fence and they're going to uh, till and work and poop on the ground where we are going to be planting food next year. So we'll move them there. They'll do work there. We will move them uh, down the mountain a little bit. They'll do some more work there. Uh, we could move them all the way back over to the other side of the property for uh, clearing or whatever an animal is capable of, whether it be goats or pigs or chickens, um, and have them work land for us before we move into it with gardens. So this gives us ultimate flexibility as far as where animals are going to go. Step one, mark out the location of T posts and fence. Step two, use the brush cutter to remove all brush and grass from right under those lines. Step three, drive the T posts. Step four, set up the fence and then the energizer. I just use T posts at key uh, places for support. The netting comes attached to these uh, fiber tough rods. Um, if I had it to do again, I would probably not go with the T-post uh, insulators and I would probably just get more fiber tough rods and tie it to the fence posts with the paracord. Um, the fiber tough rods are not conductive. At this point, we realized that there were some tree branches hanging too close to the fence that might be in contact with it. And so Nick cut those out and I helped him carry them out of the pen. Then we headed over to get our meat birds who have been living in a tiny tractor. It's a perfectly serviceable little tractor, but very small for 25 birds. And just as a precaution, we cut their primary wing feathers so that they can no longer fly. It does not harm the bird in any way, and they don't like flying anyway. Then we move them into their new home. What do you think, gentlemen? Not such a bad place, huh? You wanna go snack? King. I'm the king. No, I'm the king. So to power the fence, we're just using one of our uh, deep cycle 12 volt batteries hooked up to the uh, the energizer. Like I said, it's a one joule <laughs> energizer. Negative side goes over to a grounding rod. That's about a four foot rod jammed in the ground. And then the hot side goes right to the fence. I just gave it a, a dry place for the battery to be and uh, mounted the energizer. And I just put another tote over that so that it's relatively covered from the weather. Um, that battery is going to last really quite a long time. There's very little draw on this, uh, even with it grounding out. Um, I expect that battery to last at least a month, um, which is really not bad and we just haul it up and swap it out with another battery that's in the yurt that's charging off of solar. Okay. So you hold the button down. There's a button that makes it light up, right? Hold the button down, and then you get close to it. Yep. And it's saying that's 8,000 kilovolts. So there is a bit of a learning curve, uh, for the animals anyway, uh, for knowing what the electric fence is. It works best if you start them off really young and then they know what the, what the fence means. If they have everything they need inside of that zone, they're really probably not going to challenge the fence. Um, the only time that we've really had a problem with the birds trying to get out was uh, when they were brand new to it or when they didn't have what they needed inside. 
So um, as long as you're taking good care of the birds, then the fence isn't really the issue. Uh, so hopefully next year we'll have animals uh, not only on this terrace, but on the one above here and two or three below here um, and with food in between. And, um, and it seems like we're well on our way. We're not trying to show you a perfect electric fence set up today. The part of our journey that we're trying to carry you along on today is the part where you have to take things apart to make room for better things. So we're taking down the goat yard fence um, in order to make way for other things to happen. For one, I need to cut down a couple of trees um, to bring in light, to provide some lumber, to build our shop. Um, and I don't want to smash that fence. It's a thing of value and while we're not using it right now, I don't want to throw it in the trash. So we're bundling it up. We're going to keep it nice until we uh, have a solid plan on exactly what we're going to do uh, inside of that area that the goats have so nicely cleared and fertilized for us. As much as it stinks to undo work that you've already done, um, it's in an effort to do it right um, when we do reintroduce animals. So um, we're taking some things apart, but um, we're making the right move right now. We don't want to be held back by our own limitations. We want to be brave enough to say, we did what we knew how to do, but now we know how to do something even better. One thing I will say for that fence is that no goat ever escaped through it. Lots of our friends and neighbors have had goat escapees, um, but we never ever had a goat get through Nick's fence. He did a great job, it's very secure. We've done so much work over the last four years. We have learned how to milk a goat. We've learned how to string a fence. We've learned how to be reasonably good gardeners. We've learned so much about the different pieces of a homestead, but we still don't have all those pieces working together. We still don't have a cake. So in, in some ways we're kind of taking the pieces apart again so that we can put them back together in a way that will really work. And, and what I'm talking about in particular is having a land that will sustain the animals rather than just kind of dropping the animals on it. You can go and get goats the same way you can get an outfit from the store. You can have goats. But are we, are we having a system that supports those goats? Do we, do we have, are we using the sun and water in a way that raises those goats? Or are we just um, having goats for fun? And not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but our goal is to have a sustainable homestead where our goats are fed by the, by the land. So here on our farm, which is not impossible, animals will definitely have a place. Um, and with the electric fence and moving forward, they're gonna have a whole lot of places. Um, we love them. They're a key part of the operation. Uh, just gotta do it right. Well, thanks so much for hanging out with us for episode two of The Impossible Farm. We appreciate you. Last week, you watched us set up a multi-purpose straw bale composting project, which is doing fine. It has heated up just as expected. Come and check on us again if you like. We're going to be collecting some seeds. We're going to be featuring our girls, Sadie and Stella, and their gardens. And then we're going to be taking down some trees to provide more sunlight to our growing areas. So come and check on us now and then. We appreciate you. And until then, thanks for watching. I'm Nick Fouch. Thanks for watching. Uh, so the electric fence um, is a great new addition. Let me introduce you our electric fence testers. 
Um, it's this little device right here, uh, and it lets you know if your fence is hot or not. Were you nervous? I'm not going to uh, test it. <laughs> oh, shoot. That was awesome. About, there's a chicken laying eggs under there. And I didn't notice it. I was like, <laughs> And I'm like, why do I look under there? Are you perturbed by the interruption here, madam? <laughs> Can I touch it? No. Aww. <laughs> ha! Lord, I feel my throne! Magic! I turn you to ice when you get the orphanage. Thanks, Tulip and Hazelnut. Thanks, Thanks for being our goats. Thanks.